Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to The Philip DeFranco Show. I hope you had a fantastic Thanksgiving and weekend with friends and or family. And if not, I hope it just wasn't at least god awful. But I'm back from break. There's a lot of news to talk about. So buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. Starting with this established title situation. If you're not familiar, they're known for offering this kind of last minute fun gag gift where the company says you get to be titled Lord or Lady by buying a square foot of land in Scotland. But over the break on November 23rd, a YouTube creator by the name of Scott Schaefer put out a video saying this is a scam. Also casting doubt on a number of things, including like, do they actually donate money to plant trees like they say they do, which is a big aspect of the push. With this, him creating a list of it, it seems like a hundred big creators who have taken sponsorships with the company in the past. And the list seemed to have fucking everybody. Like you had Ben Shapiro, myself, uh, some ordinary gamer, Dr. Mike, the film theorist podcast by Logan Paul and Moist Critical. So that video blew up. We then saw established titles seemingly responding to Schaefer's video and defending their business in a statement, calling allegations made in the video false, also providing a screenshot and link to a Trees for the Future page, the charity they work with to plant trees, showing the number of trees allegedly planted with them, and describing the situation as them, quote, under a targeted, completely unfounded attack based on bogus claims from someone making a career out of personal attacks in an attempt to gain viewership and calling this a cruel and vicious attempt to cancel and slander us. Which I will say that language is interesting because slander is a legal term. So I don't know if they're involving legal and there's going to be a lawsuit. We're going to have to wait to see what's happening there. But Here's what I'll say. As far as how we're reacting to this news, I do not feel comfortable being within miles of whatever the fuck this situation is. So immediately, behind the scenes, we cut off future sponsorships with this company. We also cut them out from previous videos. Additionally, in the statement from established titles, they say, if you made a purchase and you're not enjoying it for whatever reason, they will always honor refund and cancellation requests fully and still donate to plant a tree for the order. And even though they posted what appears to be evidence that they have been planting trees, to 100% make sure I know something good came from this situation, I will be donating profits to OneTreePlanted.org. For them having a four star rating on Charity Navigator. And then what the fuck is happening with luxury fashion brand Balenciaga right now? Right, They are currently at the center of a controversy involving kids with bondage bears. Right, so let's try to unpack this. Right, so recently Balenciaga published their spring 23 campaign that featured two small children posing with teddy bears surrounded by Balenciaga products. With the problem being that these bears were dressed up in bondage gear like, like harnesses, wrists and ankle restraints and chains. And in that same campaign, an excerpt of a court case regarding child porn was reportedly included. With a case said to be a Supreme Court ruling from 2008 upholding federal statutes on pornography, including minors. And page 11 of that case was reportedly partially shown on the desk featuring a handbag. With that, obviously causing people to go, what the fuck, and causing serious backlash. With people railing against them on Twitter saying things like, I cannot believe Balenciaga who signed off. Whose idea was it even? Because they need to be in jail. This is concerning, horrifying. And Balenciaga is very much canceled in my eyes. I don't care what explanation they come up with, don't mess with children. With the company then last Tuesday taking down the campaign from all of their platforms and issuing an apology on their Instagram story, saying that the bears were not meant to be featured with children in the document was definitely not meant to be included. And then going on to say, we take this matter very seriously and are taking legal action against the parties responsible for creating the set and including unapproved items for our spring 23 photo shoot. We strongly condemn abuse of children in any form. We stand for children's safety and well-being. But this still didn't sit right with a lot of people. With people saying, oh, so Balenciaga just gets to apologize and turn off their Instagram comments and we're supposed to act like nothing happened. Others saying, this isn't something they can just apologize for. It's a crime. Balenciaga should have their stores closed. You also have Kim Kardashian mixed up in all of this, where she's been a longtime fan of Balenciaga and a recent brand ambassador. So with this happening, she released a statement on Twitter and Instagram yesterday about the incident, saying, I've been quiet for the past few days, not because I haven't been disgusted and outraged by the recent Balenciaga campaigns, but because I wanted an opportunity to speak to their team to understand for myself how this could have happened. As a mother of four, I have been shaken by the disturbing images. The safety of children must be held with the highest regard and any attempts to normalize child abuse of any kind should have no place in our society. Period. I appreciate Balenciaga's removal of the campaigns and apology. In speaking with them, I believe they understand the seriousness of the issue and will take the necessary measures for this to never happen again. As for my future with Balenciaga, I am currently reevaluating my relationship with the brand, basing it off of their willingness to accept accountability for something that should have never happened to begin with, and the actions I am expecting to see them take to protect children. So right now, I need to see how other things fall. Right? Balenciaga is reportedly suing the producers of the campaign. They've also completely purged their Instagram. And as far as what steps Balenciaga is going to take from here, that remains to be seen. And so while we wait to see, I'd love to pick your brain on this. Let me know what you're thinking with this story in those comments down below. And then, in huge business and sales news, it was just Black Friday, and apparently very few people noticed. Though, I do want to personally note, this isn't going to be the case for every company. For example, over on BeautifulBastard.com, where, by the way, you have about 48 to 72 hours to grab what you want while you can, including emotionally exhausted flower power gear. That's on low stock and might be sold out soon. Awesome sports gear. Certain sizes almost sold out. Same with the one day it will all be skeletons, comfy goodness. And the door almost closed on a brand new special. Notebooks, water bottles, 
bottles and oh, the best candle you will ever buy. And I mention all that because always be plugging, but also because y'all did actually break another record on our sales. Even though we're seeing this news today where there are companies out there that are very stressed out right? because Black Friday has historically been the unofficial start of the holiday shopping season and it serves as a key metric for how the season's gonna go. In fact, this season is such a big deal because it normally makes up nearly 20% of the retail industry's annual sales. And for many, it kicked off with a meh. With the normally massive crowds nowhere to be found with many stores that were interviewed describing it as nothing more than a slightly busy day. And there were a number of reasons, e-commerce, of course, a major aspect of it. But also it appears one of the main reasons being that you have inflation weary shoppers. With one getting straight to the problem saying, everything's going up, but your paycheck, right? And this was a nationwide trend and shoppers who did go out were holding out for the best deals. And that is despite the fact that online discount rates were about 31% on Thanksgiving itself, which is 7% more than last year. And brick and mortar stores also had steep discounts on Black Friday itself. And analysts suspect right now that most companies are either just gonna break even or only see modest profits for the year. Unless, you know, Cyber Monday just completely smashes projections. And so the question I'll ask you with this story is, what has your holiday shopping been like so far? You still did it, you didn't do it, you did, but you bought less or more, any and all things, I'd love to hear from you. Though I will say, uh, the good thing about Black Friday not being crazy is that I don't have to talk about people being trampled every single year on the same day. People used to get crazy. And then China has erupted with the biggest protest since Tiananmen Square, with thousands of people crowding the streets and university campuses in several major cities throughout the weekend calling for freedom and human rights, an end to the zero COVID policy, and even the toppling of Xi Jinping. With a lot of this being sparked by a fire at an apartment building in Xinjiang Friday that killed 10 people, including children, which was already bad enough, but people got extraordinarily pissed when videos led them to believe first responders were blocked from reaching the scene by lockdown barriers and cars left stranded by those in quarantine. Right, so this became the driving force for broader anti-lockdown protests in the vein of what we saw earlier this year in Shanghai, where you had extremely strict measures keeping people locked indoors, sometimes without food. And so we saw the candlelight vigil that was held for the victims of the fire quickly morphing into a political protest. You had people crying and shouting for freedom. Crowds in other cities even chanting, give me liberty or give me death. And understand, again, this wasn't just in reference to zero COVID. Many explicitly demanded democracy in the end of authoritarian rule. Pointing to the CCP's 20th Party Congress last month, where President Xi officially secured an unprecedented third term in office. Also there, picking the six men who will stand alongside him on the Politburo Standing Committee, China's top ruling body, all of whom are staunch Xi loyalists. With that leaving no clear successors or rivals to Xi and consolidating consolidating power to an extent not seen in decades. And so when the protests broke out, the government responded the way they usually do, with force. You saw demonstrators clashing with police, some even charging barriers, as well as footage showing individuals getting picked off and carried away into custody, with one key high-profile incident happening at a protest in Shanghai, where you had police arresting BBC reporter Ed Lawrence, then dragging him away with him heard yelling. Hey, 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 okay. Barry, call the consulate now. Okay. With the government later claiming that he never identified his press credentials and adding that the cops were trying to protect him from catching COVID in the crowd, which is extremely weird considering the outlet said that he was beaten and kicked and then held in handcuffs for several hours. You also had a Swiss journalist getting briefly arrested elsewhere in the city. Also people from multiple outlets getting physically harassed by police. We also saw workers revolt at the world's largest iPhone factory, which is owned by Foxconn because of unsafe COVID precautions and broken promises for bonuses. With videos showing people fighting police, though it eventually ended and many quit their jobs. We've also seen the government cracking down online with posts and videos of the protests getting squ- but there you have demonstrators still finding creative ways to avoid censors like simply holding up blank sheets of paper in symbolic defiance. Another person saying, are we saying anything? No, all the complaints and mourning are in our hearts. And another adding, I hope in the future I will no longer be holding a white piece of paper for what I really want to express. But understand, all of this is still ongoing as I'm recording this. You have people in the streets. But for now, that's where we are. We'll have to wait to see what happens with this flame. Does it turn into a blaze like hopefully we're also seeing in Iran or will it be snuffed out? Only time will tell, but of course, like with everything, I'd love to know your thoughts in those comments down below. And then with it being Cyber Monday and the holidays rapidly approaching, it means that we're all looking for great gift ideas. And that's where the fantastic sponsor and longtime partner of today's show, Ridge comes in. You know, I've owned a Ridge wallet before they even became a sponsor. I love that Ridge is a minimalist front pocket wallet that's slim, RFID blocking, and comes with a lifetime guarantee. Or we all know that men's wallets get bulky. You're stashing everything in there from receipts to old gift cards and cash. And that old school leather bullshit, it's just not practical for modern people. With the Ridge, it helps you carry less, but always what you need. Right, their sleek design is what I love most. There are over 30 colors and styles with two metal plates bound together by a durable elastic band. And their key case, also sleek and durable, holding up to six keys, taking the jingle out of the key ring experience. And the main thing, Ridge products are a game changer. So this holiday season, go check out their wallets and key cases at ridge.com slash defranco to get their best offer of up to 40% off until December 22nd. And then early voting is officially underway in the Georgia Senate runoff. As of today, voting is now available to every registered voter in the state, but 
thousands and thousands have already actually cast their ballots. Right, 27 counties making up more than half of the state's population held Saturday voting this weekend after a ton of drama. As we talked about on the show before, the Georgia Secretary of State said Saturday early voting, which is essential for people who can't take the time during the week to actually vote, couldn't take place because the election code barred voting in the days after a holiday. And so Senator Raphael Warnock and other Democrats sued the state and a judge actually ruled in their favor with Republicans losing their appeals. And it's a very good thing they did because turnout proved to be incredibly significant on Saturday. With the Secretary of State's office reporting over 70,000 people voted that day amid reports of long lines and wait times. Beyond that, nearly 87,000 voters also cast ballots on Sunday with Gabriel Sterling, the chief operating officer of the Georgia Secretary of State's office, saying that the turnout set a new record, tweeting it was 130% higher than the previous Sunday record of 37,785 set on October 25th, 2020. Plus, according to official data after this weekend, more than 181,700 people have either voted early or by mail. With mandatory early voting now open statewide from today until Friday, Sterling says that this high turnout is expected to continue. Writing in a tweet after voting kicked off today, turnout so far is blowing doors. As of 10.30 a.m., we have already seen 63,450 four Georgians cast their early votes in person. This is outpacing their turnout from the last day of early voting in the general election. So what we're seeing here could have a massive impact, but as far as whether this high early voting is going to benefit one candidate over the other, surprisingly, experts actually say it's hard to tell right now. Right, well, some have noted that while Republicans historically show up for early voting more than Democrats, Warnock actually got more votes than Herschel Walker during early voting in the general. And GOP-led efforts to limit Saturday voting could hurt Walker here. But at the same time, the two have been polling neck and neck. So we really don't know what's going to happen until the votes are counted on December 6th. So if you live in Georgia and you haven't already, come up with a voting plan, go out and vote. Because remember, every vote counts and you get to decide if the senator from Georgia is Raphael Warnock or a constantly lying hypocrite deadbeat father whose ex-wife said he pointed a pistol at her face. And then it's easy to take for granted things like having clean running water in your home. But I'll tell you, people in Houston right now, not taking it for granted. And that's because the entire city of Houston, we're talking 2.2 million residents of Texas are under a water boil advisory. With that warning being issued yesterday after a power outage at a water purification plant caused pressure to drop. And so if you are in Houston, they're telling you to boil water for at least two minutes before using it for food preparation, drinking, bathing, or brushing your teeth, as well as please avoid using water from refrigerators or ice makers. We also saw Governor Greg Abbott announce that the state is directing emergency resources to Houston until the issue is resolved. We also had the mayor's office last night saying it believed that the water is safe, but that it was required to issue the boil notice due to regulations. And even going on to say the water samples will be collected and the city has to wait 24 hours after it's been told the water is safe before it can lift the advisory and adding earliest would be Monday night or very early Tuesday morning. So it appears the good news here this is probably going to be short-lived. The bad news, though, is no matter how short-lived, it still causes a massive disruption for millions of people. And that goes beyond needing to boil potable water. This issue also resulted in the Houston Independent School District, which is the largest public school system in Texas, serving nearly 200,000 kids, as well as other smaller districts, to close all their schools today. And it also underscored broader questions about the stability of Texas's essential infrastructure that have remained since the devastating winter storm last year that put much of the state in crisis with power outages and no running water. And while this is, yes, the biggest water crisis Houston has faced since the storm, surrounding areas have also recently been placed on water boil advisories, as have other major Texas cities throughout the last year, including Austin, where errors at a treatment plant cause the city of one million to be placed on a water boil notice. And so as a result, you have some questioning Texas's water systems as well as local officials' communication surrounding these issues. Many there taking to social media to criticize city authorities for taking hours to notify the public. But there you had Houston Public Works responding on Twitter by saying there are proper procedures and protocols in place before a boil water notice can be issued. But others also complain that they literally got no notice from the government and only ended up finding out because of social media. But also, a key thing that I want to touch on here, Texas is in no way the only place in America that has issues like this or questions being raised. Right, of course, Flint, Michigan is the classic example, but more recently, cities like Baltimore and Jackson, Mississippi have also seen similar problems. And you have this situation where retrofitting or replacing these systems costs a lot of money that state and local governments often don't have, and federal funding also falls short. So unfortunately, unless more things change as time goes on, like the stories like this aren't going to be outliers or just eventualities. And then, can a company put out too much of a good thing? Right, like, would fans be upset if there was a new Marvel movie every month or a new Star Wars series every week? Because that's that is exactly what we're seeing many people say about the popular card game Magic the Gathering right now. Also, even if you don't fuck with card collecting or card games, this is fascinating. Right, this story covers new media, fandoms, business. And to get started, the key thing you need to know is that the company behind Magic, Wizards of the Coast, and its parent company, Hasbro, have been accused of getting greedier and greedier and that just not paying off for them. And actually, because when it comes to Magic, I'm just some outsider, we decided to reach out to Brian Lewis, better known as the professor from the YouTube channel Tolarian Community College. With essentially the kickoff question being, what are the top things Hasbro has done to fuck up Magic for the community? Number one is there's too many products, too much oversaturation. This means that players can't savor the flavor, which used to be a, a catchphrase of Magic the Gathering, and can't enjoy 
the true design that's coming out in these products and and uh, even remember what cards are where. It's too much coming out too fast. I think number two is definitely cost of uh, uh, accessing the gameplay. And number three, I would say, is definitely the gathering. Uh, we have had some return after pandemic to events, but Wizards does not seem interested in bringing back events as they were, things like GPs. The key thing is, like, this isn't just his feeling. The stuff he touched on appears to have been so mishandled that even Bank of America took notice, with them releasing a report double downgrading Hasbro's stock. And it's not like they said MTG was a partial cause, but rather this game that has a massive following of tens of millions of players worldwide was the reason for the downgrade. And that has not helped Hasbro's stock, which has taken a beating. Right, and going back to the stuff Brian talked about, it's easy to see that an oversaturation of products is, of course, the thing that players are most frustrated with. Right? I mean, you got players from every socioeconomic background saying there's just too much shit to buy. Or like, here are Magic's releases since the game came out. This year alone saw a dramatic spike of more than one new product or set of cards being released every single week. And for many, adding insult to injury, the quality of the cards also has heavily decreased, with the leading many fans to have this sense of like, what's the point of buying this if it's literally just a worse product? I don't think you need to be an expert insider in Magic the Gathering to take a look at what Wizards of the Coast is doing and say, and like, look at things like they're having major issues with too much unsold product because they're printing so much so fast. Local game stores can't clear it out. They have to clear it out on discount on Amazon. Warehouse is full. That's not a good thing. And on top of all that, Hasbro has increasingly moved to sell sealed products directly to consumers through Amazon and single cards through its secret layer program, which reprints cards based on themes for about $40. With that leading to different groups within Magic getting upset. You've got players who invest in more expensive cards, mad that Wizard is reprinting cards, which in turn has a potential to devalue their collections. And players who can't afford expensive cards are still upset because they're being sold for $40. Meanwhile, you have game stores angry because they don't get access to any of this. And that last part is a big deal, according to the professor. You must realize Magic the Gathering exists in no small part, in fact, in a large part, due to local game stores who take all the risk. These are independent people who open up stores, they take out the small business loan, they sell Magic's product, they teach new players how to play the game. You think Amazon teaches you how to play the game? You think Walmart has a space for you to play the game? No, it's the local game stores, and they're who've been around. They wanna cut out local game stores. They have cut out local game stores, secret layers, is, uh, is them cutting out like local game stores, but also just their prices on Amazon are cutting out local game stores. Your local game store likely has to pay more to get product from Wizards of the Coast than you have to pay on Amazon for that product. These new sets coming out, they're cheaper on Amazon than the local game store is paying for the product. So literally local game stores now have to compete with Wizards of the Coast to sell and popularize Magic the Gathering. We also asked if he, through his fans, has noticed the same general sense of product fatigue that we saw when looking into the story. They do have a fatigue. They've had a fatigue for a long time. We've all been talking about this because at the end of the day, you know, it, it, in some ways it's, it's a better sign that you have Magic players complaining than Magic players not complaining because not complaining is we're just going to go play a different game like, you know, Digimon or Flesh and Blood or whatever. But Magic players complaining is I'm passionate about this game. I want it to be better. I'm upset about the direction. Magic players have been complaining for the last couple years about this. Wizards of the Coast has been very dismissive. But one of the biggest controversies right now in this community, the thing that's been all over the news and social media as the pinnacle of how out of touch Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast is? Is their Magic 30th release, which was just released today. So why? What is it? Well, it's a reprint of Magic cards from the game's earliest history that players can access by buying four booster packs for a round, wait for it, $1,000 for a total of 60 random cards. Right, you then compare that to a normal booster pack for a normal set, which costs around three to four dollars. Right, so Hasbro likely thought this product's gonna be a smash hit. Right, the cards in the set include Magic's most iconic cards that Wizards of the Coast promised they would never reprint, which helped drive their prices into the, if you have to ask, you can't afford it level. But also, the company doesn't think that it's lying. Right? In order to skirt around their self-imposed reprint prohibition, they change these cards to not be playable in normal games and change how they look to differentiate them, which has led many fans to go, what is the point of this fucking product? You can't technically use and play the cards and you price out the vast majority of players. And it's been so controversial that major figures in the MTG space have released videos saying, So again, on this first video out of many in the next few weeks, I ask you all, love, hate, however you are, please do not buy it. If you do not vote with your wallet, 
we all lose. That was Rudy from the channel Alpha Investments and his and others' calls to action may have actually paid off as the product was made unavailable about 30 minutes after going live, leading to many saying that the company wanted to make it seem more successful than it was. And that result isn't too surprising as the professor seemingly saw it coming when he gave us this answer when we asked, who is this product for? The product is without a doubt an unmitigated disaster and who it's for is I had no one that actually plays Magic the Gathering, and interestingly enough, not even most people who collect Magic the Gathering, well, certainly there's always going to be someone somewhere that's going to buy it and, and try and find some value that they can flip it for later, even though it's not even cards you can play with. It really is a product for no one, and the fact that this is hailed by Wizards of the Coast as their anniversary uh, addition, something to celebrate 30 years of the game, of community, of the players, and it's as much as some people make it a month for 60 fake magic cards. They're not even real. It's it's astonishing that they would do this and, and think it was a good idea. And here's the thing, at the end of the day, you know, this is a business. But it feels like when you talk to people and you watch people speak in this space, like, they are aware of this. It's just the degree of what this company is doing that is pissing people off. I know companies, corporations are going a corporation, right? But there's a point where it's like, whoa, take it down a notch. Just at least let us play the game and enjoy the game. And that seems to be an afterthought in so much of what this company does now. But ultimately where I'm going to close this story, uh, one, thank you to Brian Lewis for taking the time to speak with us. If you're interested in this space or Brian, I cannot recommend you clicking that link down below enough. And for me, even like I said, as a normie outsider, I'm, I'm very fascinated to see what's going to happen with this space and community moving forward. Is it a moment of self-reflection and growth? Not because like a company needs to be moral, but when you engorge yourself so much, you got to cut off a limb to survive. Like that's not a great thing to do, which also, I mean, is a weird position to be in, right? The majority of solutions being proposed is be less greedy and hope that makes you more money versus what I imagine kind of part of their model is right now in that they're they're whale hunting or they're thinking fuck the people that buy you know several five dollar packs they'll trade a hundred of those in for some whale that's gonna drop you know 17 to twenty five thousand dollars on <laughs> less than a hundred booster packs but then you know there is the prospect of do you hurt the community so much that it then hurts the sales which makes it so the whales aren't interested which is why I said even as someone that's not in this space I'm fucking fascinated and now that you've made it through the story with me i, I want to ask the question whether you're in the community or you're not what are your thoughts and takeaways but that is where that story in today's show ends thank you for watching liking and being a part of my daily dives in the news with you as a friendly reminder you got about 48 to 72 hours left if you want to snag something from beautifulbastard.com but as always my name is philip defranco you've just been filled in i love yo faces and i'll see you tomorrow